try to stand in the uh, shade. Um, and you have to excuse my notes. I wasn't told I wasn't supposed to uh, have notes. And uh, um, I, I normally wing my way through a three hours uh, lecture with facing uh, 500 Chinese parents. But Anthony told me you, you lot were a much tougher crowd. So uh, I, I measured out every single word. Um, and uh, I, I must pay gratitude to the speakers uh, before me because um, um, you built up this theme and uh, which makes my delivery much easier. Um, a few weeks ago when having morning tea with a fellow Waldorf teacher, I told her, oh, today my son didn't go to school, he's homesick because he had too much fun at a sleepover, he's now suffering the consequences. And she slapped the back of my hand in mock horror, exclaiming, how dare you let your son go to sleepovers? You're not being a good tiger mom. <laughs> and I replied in kind, oh my goodness, I am the worst type of mom by tiger mom's criteria. I allow my children to go to sleepovers. I don't push them to play the piano. I let them skip brain dead homework and I even let them participate in the school drama. Worst of all, I wrote and directed the play myself. <laughs> How on earth will my children ever compete in this dog eat dog world in the future? The trouble is, most of my parenting ideas are the diametric opposite of the tiger moms. Uh, for example, I have this twisted notion that by old age, if, if one by old age recalls a Carnegie Hall recital at the tender age of 14 as the highlight of their life has in fact not achieved much. But if somebody at, in old age recalls, oh gosh, this sounds like Henry V now. <laughs> Sweet Ashikor. Um, if someone in old age would recall with pride that they were involved in the staging of the first Weihnachtsspiele in the first Waldorf school in Beijing, that they created history, that at the age of 14, they moved an entire room of adults to tears, that they made a difference in the lives of many children and parents, that they follow their dreams. This person has lived their life to the full. Many people ask the question, what is education? And there are many different answers. But recently, I just saw this answer coming from a principal an elementary school principal in Wuhan who said, education means let my students sleep well tonight so that they don't jump off the, a building tomorrow. I have to deliver it in Chinese. 教育就是今天睡好觉,明天不跳楼. So today more and more parents are questioning the wisdom and the supposed necessity of driving their children so hard that they give up on life before life has really begun. These parents dread that their children will become one of these horrifying statistics, such as 80% of elementary and middle school students in China sleep than eight hours a day. 25% of university students are clinically depressed. And 20% of what we call the leftover, 剩, 剩女, 剩男, leftover uh, uh, bachelors, single people, who hold higher degrees and good jobs, but who have never been in love. So sleep has become a luxury for children in this country. But sleep is vitally important for every one of us, that long childhood. Actually, scientists have only begun to understand the significance of sleep for our life. Dr. Terry can t 
talk more about that. I won't, I won't go into there. S to sleep, perchance to dream. Unfortunately, 15 years ago, Hamlin never got to deliver this line on top of Jin Shanlin. He uh, broke his ankle even before getting to a nunnery. So to sleep, perchance to dream. We all know that an exa unexamined life is not worth living. How about a dream life, a dreamless life is not worth living? By the way, dreams are important for us, not just for the romantic notions. There is actually scientific proof that dreams are important for cognition as well. My childhood dream was to become a theatrical director. I wrote and directed my first play when I was eight years old. But my parents were dead against me when I tried to test for the Central Academy of Drama. Their reason was simple yet strange for a teenager back 30 years ago. In the world of entertainment, there was too much sex. To avoid that, they sent me to America instead. <laughs> So after living in the States for eight years, the first thing I did when I came back to Beijing was to join the Peking Players, an amateur drama, drama society. And with my then boyfriend, then fiance, and now husband, we uh, got involved and, and produced a handful of productions, plays and musicals. Those were the more memorable days of my life I certainly had more fun doing amateur theater than working at my real job. Then we had kids, which means not much social life for a few years, let alone anything as fun as theater. And then one day, after writing a few books on breastfeeding and parenting, I woke up with a hat on my head that said, education expert. I tried to take it off. I tried really hard to take it off, but it stuck to me. So I had to accept it. But whenever I look at this title, I just feel it's so limiting. For one thing, I don't look the part. I don't look serious enough to be called an expert. And there are so many other things that I can do, I love doing, and I have been doing that cannot be defined by an education expert. So starting from last year, I started sneaking into my daughter's class once a week to teach the children with singing, dancing, rhythm, games, stories, and art. And starting from, from this February, I became a drama teacher for class seven at the new Waldorf school I helped create. Then I gave a drama workshop to a group of summer camp counselors. Now I am designing my own drama workshop for parents, which combines what I love doing, which is theater, with what I view as my mission on this earth, which is spreading good ideas about education. So you see, at the age of 46, I'm still pursuing my childhood dream. Because I know if I didn't, I can never say I have lived a happy and fulfilled life. Parents who choose to go down this alternative path are most worried about one thing. Will my child be able to integrate into society? Will they have a really good future? Will they become social outcasts? As a child, I was labeled a dreamer. People said I lived in my fantasy world. And that was frowned upon. Um, this has followed me all the way into adulthood. But finally, a few years ago, I, I found an education that encourages dreams and fantasies in which fairy tales are an integral part of the curriculum. So I wholeheartedly embrace this education which allows the child to be an active part of this world, to be connected with this world, 
and to not feel that they are being shaped to fit into society, but they are someone who brings fresh energy into this world. So you see, for me, there is no such thing as a society that we must chip off our corners to fit into. And there is no future that we must give up our dream to reach. We can all create an environment that accommodates our vision. The future is shaped by our dreams. In my vision, the future is a world in which the well-being of communities is more important than the individual triumphs that are achieved at the expense of all else, where people are valued more for their ability to contribute to the collective well-being of society and to work together to achieve common goals. Because, why do I say that? I need to demonstrate why do I say that, because that brings us the deepest satisfaction. In my workshop, I have some very simple exercises for people to do. And one of them is, I'll give them each a prop. It could be a fruit, could be a tennis ball, or it could be a ball of yarn, which I used uh, just this past weekend, because we're gonna, we were going to do some knitting after the exercises. So in a circle, we stand in a circle, we hold this in our hands, and we move three steps forward, and we give this out. And then we move back, and there is a rhythm, and we do it. At first, you could see people are very focused on, am I doing the right thing, on their individual action. And then gradually, I coach them, and then they realize the best way to do it is to not look at their hands or the fruit or anything or their neighbors, but to give it out with a smile, look at the person across from you, the person you're really giving it to. And another exercise is you give this gift to yourself first. You receive it. And then you give it to yourself, yourself again. And then you pass it on. So the rhythm is short, short, long. So short, short, long. You give it and you take it. It's give and take. And at first, in every workshop, people would drop these things, or somebody would end up with three, while you know, someone else would end up with none. And then there's commotion, there's chaos, and people are so focused. You take this, give this to me, and you should be receiving, because we also do it like you, know, you, 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 you go to the next person, or two people down. And then they're so focused on their action, it's chaotic, and, but gradually they will see that they come into this, this rhythm. And how do you get this rhythm? By not looking at your own hands and focus and use your head. Our head is cut off from our heart and our head and heart are cut off from our will, our, our limbs, our body. You need to synchronize, <coughs> harmonize that. So you look at other members of the group and you judge the rhythm and then you do it in sync. Because we, we don't need to look at our hands to know where they are. We all have proprioception. Unless we're, you know, neurologically damaged. So we don't need to know that. You, we only, the only thing we need to do is to trust that I will receive and someone will take me to trust this group dynamic. <coughs> so in the end, you have this rhythm, this perfect rhythm. And everyone is looking at each other with a big smile on their face. And you know what happens? People start crying. Not everyone, but some people would inevitably always start crying. So an 11-year-old boy best describes this vision in his homework assignment, in which the teacher asks everyone to write, why is it important that we care about each other? And this boy wrote, 
In this world, we must take care of each other, otherwise we cannot survive. Actually, we are all just one life. If one person gets hurt or is in danger, we must help him. We must cooperate to keep each other alive, so as to keep the whole life force alive. When he was seven years old, this boy told his mom, when I grow up, I want to help the world. Throughout the years, he has changed his dream jobs many times. He's wanted to become a rock star like Michael Jackson, a World Cup soccer player like Lionel Messi, or a wizard like Harry Potter, or um, an astronomer like those uh, Star Trek figures. But one theme remained constant. I want to help this world. So if our future is shaped by people who share this boy's vision, then I say it's a good world to live in. Then I would say these people have received very good education. And one last thing, I get this question all the time. My son is learning, my, my child is learning the piano. Um, he wants to give up. Should I let him? Wouldn't that damage his willpower? that he's not persisting, that he can just give up so easily. And my answer is always, no, you don't train the will by pushing him on the piano. If you want to train the will, bring him here. Let him climb up the Great Wall, especially go between Jinshanling and Sima Tai. That's how you train the will. Our kids have been hiking up mountains around Beijing ever since they could walk, which was about one and a half years old. And they could hike up unrepaired Great Wall for about 30 kilometers in about five hours in one go. But this kind of training brings side effect. Yes, my son has been learning the piano since he was six. Uh, my pianist husband has been his coach. And they have fought, they have fought over every single practice for the past five years. And at times of extreme tension, I really, I always thought my son would give up because it's so unpleasant. But oddly enough, he persisted in both playing the piano and in fighting with his father. <laughs> that shows your will, doesn't it? Thank you very much.